the uh, the Gemara that we've been learning actually the last few days had to do with the um, liquid versus solid, the uh, drinking the shatisa, which our Gemara <coughs> mentioned. Shatisa is an, uh, seemed like it was an argument. Rav and Shmuel, one of them said it's mezainais, the other one said it's it's shahakol, and the Gemara explains not an argument. One of them was talking about when it's thick. The other one's talking about when it's when it's liquidy. So we mentioned yesterday about how to uh, where to draw the line. Where do you draw the line between something that's uh, liquid, something that's that that one drinks, to, and and which is shahakal, and if it's thick, that it's mezainus because it has, of course, it has grain has from the five grains, so it would be mezainus. So uh, we mentioned the uh, Taisus over here mentions the word Sayyid Asalev, which we said satisfies the heart. And the Alter Rebbe does bring that term in his uh, in his Sayyid Rech Um We also mentioned in the Shulchan Aruch, it uses the term that something that is uh, thick, that it's fit to be eaten and to chew. So use this word to chew. And the bracha would be Mazaynais, but if it's something that's fit to drink, it would be shahakla. And the problem that the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch had was that, that there's a gap in the middle that you're not really clarifying. If it's thick that you would chew it, that's a very extreme, that's, that's, that's food, because you're chewing it. But what about, and, and, and then the Shulchan Aruch says, if it's so thin that you drink it, you know, shahakal. What about the middle? What about in between where it's thick, but you're not going to chew it? Something that's thicker. You know, you don't chew, but you, but you, uh, but it is, it is, it's not something you would drink. You would eat it with a spoon. You would eat it in a, in a, it would be with a, you would eat it with a spoon, basically. You wouldn't drink it like in a cup. It is something that's thicker. So that was the question that, you know, that we were sort of uh, touching of dealing with yesterday. And uh, we mentioned that the Mishavura brings that um, he brings from other commentaries that the uh, when it says to chew, it doesn't really mean to chew. But the bottom, the 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 the, the main point is is it um, is it something that one would drink, or is it not something that you would drink? So it depends on if it's something you would drink, I guess, like in a cup, or something you would eat, I guess, with a spoon, would be would be considered that it's thick, something thick that would be, if it's normally drank that way or normally eaten that way, even if you don't chew it, but it would be something that's thicker than would be drank, then it would be misinous. Yes, uh, Susan. Okay, often I make oatmeal that's very thin and I drink uh -huh. it in a cup. I put it in the refrigerator because I make too much. I take it out later on and I have to use a spoon. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, my thought is that that falls into the category that we, that we mentioned uh, yesterday, that the, the, the continuation of the Mishnah Brura is that here we're really talking about that it, you don't really see the grain. But if you see the grain, like, for example, oatmeal, so even though it's a very liquidy oatmeal, um, but it, if you're seeing the grain, you are going to recite the bracha on the grain. The okay. question would be the bracha on the liquid, because that liquid is could be that it deserves a bracha. Now, if you were drinking um, the uh, maple, uh, the maple oatmeal, you know, making, you know, you, so you have a lot of you have like a, a flavor in that liquid that you're drinking, like it has a, uh, you know, a brown sugar or maple maple syrup type a of flavor in it. Plain straight homemade right. oatmeal, nothing oatmeal. instant, no microwave. Right. right, so 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 the reason you have make it very liquidy is because you want to drink water with it. What? Why are you making it so liquidy? It's just easier to, because I have animals to feed in the morning, it's just easier. Faster, it, faster. I mean, yes. you're looking for it to save time. Right. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, in that situation, I don't know that you would recite a bracha on the water. I would think that you would recite the bracha on the just the mazainis on the oatmeal. The green. Okay. Yeah. It would seem well, to I me have like a similar. That. I have a similar situation. We make uh, every morning, my husband makes every morning a smoothie 
out of frozen bananas and uh, almond milk and sometimes uh, some other fruits go into it. Mm -hmm. And it's thick enough to eat with a spoon. Or if it melts, then you can drink it. Sort of like if you were having, let's say, ice cream and it melted. It would be, uh -huh. in case it's a solid and the other side, it's a liquid. So you're talking about ground up fruits and uh, the reason why they're, you would eat them with a spoon is because they're, you're freezing them. Is that there's ice in it? It's somehow it's freezing them. Like why are, are they ground up completely? Like how could you drink it sometimes and sometimes not be able to drink it? Why, why is that? You have a blender and uh -huh. you put your frozen fruit into the blender oh. and okay. then it grinds it up. And it makes, and you put some liquid in, and then it becomes something which is, which can be eaten with a spoon or it can be drunk. It's kind of exactly in that it'll intermediate oh, situation you're talking about. Right, right, right. Not asking for a halakhic ruling, just giving another example. Right. <laughs> right. If you, if you mach me, I'm just you one say, it, One thing, if you're not, you say you're not. Right. Well, it, it definitely sounds like an interesting, well, it, the, the only question is how ground up, I guess, are these, you know, how do you, how much do you blend it? Do you blend it like people blend soup and they make it that you cannot see any pieces? You know, like how blend, you know what I mean? How, how, how blended do you, do you make it? Do you want, I guess that, that, that could be something that it'll depend on. In any event, okay, and we're not going to ask your husband what bracha he recites on it, but uh, at some point, maybe, uh, well, well, we'll look into it further. So uh, what I wanted to just touch upon is that our Gemara mentioned that Rav holds Shatisa is Shahako, and Shmuel says Shatisa is Berimina Mazainus, and the, the Gemara said it's not an argument. One is thick, one is, one is loose. So who is telling us uh, something innovative between the two of those rabbis? Which one really told us something important that we wouldn't have known? Think about their statements. Rav said that Shatisa is Shahako. Shmuel said it's Barimina Mazainis. So, you know, if, if the rabbis are saying something in the Gemara, they have to be, there has to be something innovative that they're teaching us that we would not have known. And they're not going to repeat it, um, you know, in saying Shmuel, different, different ways Shmuel of saying the, the same thing. So who do you think is saying something unique? Shmuel is the latest, right? So if he's the latest, he's the one that brings you something new. No, no, Rav and Shmuel were at the same time. They, they, the they argue time. often. Yeah, they argue often. So the question is, so so which one sounds innovative? Yes, Simone. Yeah, so we had said earlier that originally both of them said that you made the bracha based on the, the grain, that if there was, uh, say, barley or whatever that we uh, that was- Five grains, one of the five grains. For five grains, you made, that was the thing you made the bracha. The innovative thing is there now a situation where you move the grains, you don't make that bracha. On, you don't use the, that, the bracha for the grain. Wow, very good, very good, Simone. That's right. So, so it sounds like um, Rav is, is telling us something very important here. That even though you would think the bracha should be mezainais, because anything that has grain in it is mezainais, but here Rav tells us this is an exception. You're drinking it, or it's the medicine, according to the other explanation, but basically you're, you're not going to be reciting a mezainais, you're reciting a shahaka. So why is Shmuel even talking? That's the question. What is Shmuel telling us? You want to tell me that Shatisa is Mazainis and it's you know, a thick Shatisa is Mazainis? That's such an important thing to tell me. Isn't that obvious? Anything that has grain in it is Mazainis. So why is Shmuel, what is Shmuel really teaching us? It seems um, uh, not such a, He's not really telling us anything that we didn't know before. So one of the commentaries in the Shulchan Aruch 
wants to say that maybe what he's teaching us is that Shatisa is a thick type of drink, but you do not chew it. And what he's teaching us is, even though you don't chew it, it would still retain its bracha since it is thick. In other words, he's teaching us a law that uh, for us, it's a little maybe hard to relate to because we don't know what shatisa really is. Uh, or at least we're not, most of us don't eat a, don't, uh, eat or drink shatisa. But the, I guess it was something common in those days. And what Shmuel was saying was that this shatisa, that's thick, it's still something that you don't chew. And the bracha on it, will retain, will be, the bracha mezaynes is retained even, even though you don't chew it, but it, it, as long as it's thick, it's something that you don't normally drink, that would be a bracha of mezaynes. So that would be a way of seeing this interpretation that they want to explain in the Shulchan Aruch, that it doesn't mean you have to chew it. That would follow with, you would see that in the Gemara, because why is Shmuel telling us this? if not to teach us this special law. So that, that's one way of, of, of learning Shmuel's um, in a, in, innovation, that he's really teaching us that you don't have to chew it to be obligated in a mosaic. That would be like a source in the Gemara for that, for that uh, halacha. Okay, so um, we mentioned yesterday the argument, the question of it's what the bracha on bread should be. If the bracha on bread is moitzi or ha we had Rabbi Nechemya. Rabbi Nechemya wanted to say it should be moitzi, and the rabbis said, say ha and they brought verses, and the verses, um, we brought verses both ways. And ultimately, um, the rabbis stuck to their opinion, and they say that it means the past tense. And the uh, and Reb Nechemia felt that Hamoitzi does not mean the past tense, and um, therefore Reb Nechemia says you got to do Moitzi because what we see in the Gemara is that the brachas should be the past tense. And they're arguing about the bracha on bread. Then came a story of Reb Zvid. And um, sorry, the son of Reb Zvid. The story of the son of Reb Zvid, who uh, uh, the, the rabbis said about him that he was very knowledgeable in brachas. He's an expert. And uh, they told this to Reb Zvid. Reb Zvid said, no, bring him, bring him over. So next time he came to town, they brought him over. So this is the son of Rav Zvid, was brought to Rav Zera, And Rav Zera gave him some bread. Of course, he was testing him. See what bracha he's going to make. I recite on the bread. And the bracha he recited was Maitzi. So Rav Zera was very, very uh, saddened um, and felt uh, let down. Like this is a, such a great uh, expert in brachas that he, he, he says Maitzi. If we would have said Hamaitzi, we would have uh, we would have an uh, understanding of what Hamaitzi means. We would have know the halacha follows the rabbis, but um, but uh, he said Maitzi. I mean, what is he teaching us? So the Gemara and the Gemara says the reason why he said Maitzi was because he didn't want to get involved in an argument. So he said Maitzi, but. Uh, Rav Zera felt he really should have said Hamaitzi, and uh, he was surprised. Yes, Simone. Isn't it equally possible that he said Motsi because he disagreed and he didn't think Hamotzi was the correct bracha? In other words, he, he took his, his personal opinion was hmm. he sided with the rabbis. The fact that the no, no, that no, rabbi, he, he sided with Rabbi Nechemia. Yes, the, he sided with Rabbi Nechemia. Yeah. 
Yeah. So okay. that was that was uh, you know that was the position he took. He didn't. So the right. other rabbi didn't agree with him. It didn't mean that uh, he he the other rabbi Zevid rabbi no Zera rabbi Zera wanted him to take his position, but he didn't. You no, know, he didn't. That's all. It didn't agree with him. Right. So the thing is that the argument between the Chemya and the rabbis are the Tanoim. These are these are rabbis of an earlier generation uh, where they, they're the authors of the Mishnah and the Brises. Reb Zera and uh, this rabbi, the son of Reb Zvid, these are Amay So they can't really just argue on the earlier opinions, but in this situation, you could say, well, he's following one of the earlier views, which is what you want to say, and Rabbi Nechemi was one of the earlier views. The problem is that really the halacha follows the rabbis. The only reason here there might be room to think differently would be because the rabbis agree with Reb Nechemia that his way is acceptable. So you may say that, you know, maybe the, the halacha doesn't follow the rabbis here. Normally we follow the majority. So you might think that we don't follow the majority. The final conclusion is we do follow the majority, and really you you are supposed to say Hamoitzi. So if the son of Rav Zvid um, wanted to pass in a halacha that you should say Moitzi, that would be problematic because he's really going against the. I mean, that's really taking a side. Well, then what was, it, the, what was the purpose? What was the point that Rav Zvid was trying to make in asking? the son of Zerah to make the bracha. He was trying to make a point. So what it seems like is that Reb Zera knew as himself, obviously, an expert, if he's going to test this, this young uh, rabbi. So he knew the halacha follows the rabbis. And that's the except, that's the way, that's the final thing. But I guess it wasn't as well known. And um, I guess there were people maybe that still said Moitzi or, uh, you know, as well. And, but the proper thing to say is Ha Moitzi, even though it's innovative, but as someone who, Reb Zera, who himself was a, you know, somewhat of an expert, he felt, you know, that's, that's what should be done. And anyone that just does Moitzi is really uh, not proving anything. They're just uh, trying to, you know, they're trying to just get away with it. And if you do ha mitzi, it means you're willing to take a stand. So mitzi won't prove anything. Um, I, I think assuming that he was doing mitzi, see, there, there's two reasons why he might have done mitzi. One is because the way you're explaining that maybe he wanted to show that he follows Reb Nehemia. The other re way reason why he's doing mitzi is to sort of fit with not, you know, not involve himself in an argument. It actually works better, I think, that he's going to not get into an argument and follow that view than to say that he's picking the other side of saying, I'm following Reb Nechemi, this is my psaq, because in that sense, he would be wrong. In other words, if he's going to do that, that actually means, you know, would ruin his uh, uh, potential of being an expert, what they're thinking that he's an expert. So it, I think they're giving him the benefit of the doubt that. He wasn't doing that. He wasn't uh, paskening like Reb Nechemia because he really shouldn't paskin like one, even though in this scenario, there might be thoughts to do that, but you really, really, it, that's not the final halacha. So what, what, you know, your option that he might've been doing that is possible, but uh, I guess they gave him the benefit of the doubt. Well, but he is defined here as, uh, he was described as a great man and an expert in this. So right. it seems then why would Reb Zevid have, um, in a sense, embarrassed him like that and then criticized him afterwards? It seems like it's a funny interaction there. It's definitely a surprising story of the Gemara. There are many surprising stories. This is one of them. Um, and the commentaries, uh, I can't, I can't uh, deny the fact that the commentaries do delve into this uh, and try to figure out, you know, what he meant, what he could have said, what he should have said. 
you know, they, they do delve into this. It's not like it's not discussed in the commentaries. It is. It's, it's very much discussed mm -hmm. in the commentaries. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and you're right, it is a little surprising that he, uh, you know, that he, that he did this. Uh, I, I, I don't assume he embarrassed him in public. I think he, uh, um, um, uh, he might have, it, it, it's a little unclear, um, you know, did he tell this to, uh, to the person himself or did he tell this back to the rabbis? Well, if you look at the words, it says, he said, Moitzi. So, so this so Reb Zera said, this is a person that they say about him that he's an Adam Gadol. So, um, now does that mean he told this to him, or did he say it to himself, or did he say this back to the rabbis who spoke highly of him? He said, "This is mm -hmm. the one that they say is Bucky." If it, it would be good if he would have said it, doesn't say if you would have said. So it, it implies he didn't even say this to him. It would have been good if he would have said, E. Omar. Um, That's even worse. He's talking about him behind his back to his, uh, his co patriots. <laughs> yeah, do you really think that that's bad? For sure. It's much better if you speak directly to the person uh, that you have a complaint about or criticism rather than talking about him when he's not there to his peers. Mm, yeah, I think so. So, how do you explain the Gemara then? I explained it that these are human beings having actual emotions, and that sometimes people are um, sin. People sin. I, I wouldn't use the word sin. You know, people do mm -hmm. normal things that people do. Sometimes they're a little jealous. Oh. Sometimes they're a little mm -hmm. egotistical, right. and that's how people right. are. Uh huh. So we're not going to learn it that way, um, but. Um, it, you know, it is um, the, the the way the Gemara words it is. Rabbi, could I interrupt? That, yes. Maybe it's a misquote. No. Maybe it was. It's not a misquote. This is in the Gemara, and uh, this is a story, and it does say that you know that this person said, "Is this what they say about him?" That he's a great person, it would have been good if he would have said something else. How much? I find it very surprising. I, it very surprising. And and what's like, so surprising? Like the says it's a kind of surprise. What, what's surprising to you about that? It? That, that it's almost like a criticism. It's and what's wrong with criticizing someone who's wrong? You got to correct people. I'm, I would never correct you, Rabbi. I'm sorry. I wouldn't. <laughs> Even if well, you were wrong, I would never correct you, ever. Uh-huh. Thank you. Maybe well, that the thing is, yeah. What do you want, Isaac? Well, I was just going to say that you can read it a lot more innocently, that the Chachamim were praising him to Reb Zera, and Reb Zera had had him come in. He didn't set him up. They were together, whatever, and he made, he made a bracha motzi. And at some point later, Reb Zera said to the students, you know, uh, I thought uh, he said he was such an expert, meaning they're reinforcing what the halacha is. And then the Gemara tries mm -hmm. to go one of a way of explaining what mm -hmm. he was saying. Why did he say this if he's an expert? That he was basically making a bracha to, according to everybody, so that there shouldn't be any argument over what the bracha is. I guess if you say ha motzi and everybody says motzi, there could be an argument. So, mm -hmm. and he said, to trying to explain, I'm reading what this is from the daf, from the daf advancement forum. Reb Zera, they said, they say mm -hmm. that he's an expert on brachas, meaning, had he said ha -motzi, we would have learned the meaning of the verse and that the halacha follows the chachomim. But by saying motzi, he didn't teach us anything. So then the Gemara answers, he said motzi to fulfill his obligation according to all opinions. So 
I guess from Jaira wanted to hear a new deal for his, a proof or something. And he played it safe and made a bracha in a strange house to cover him with everybody. That's all. I'm not really sure, Isaac, how you're answering. What, what they're wondering is, number one, did he say this to himself? Did he say this to others? Would that be gossip? Did he say this to the person, to the, to the rabbi himself? In, in other words, did the, you know, three options here. He might have thought this in his mind. He might have told this to the person and told him off. Or he might have told this uh, to the rabbis who had spoken highly of this person. So there, the 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 the, um, the Gemara is a little vague because it doesn't really say who he said it to, um, but it does say the word if he would have said, which bishloima i amar, which is, is still not clear if that is the, the Gemara explaining to him or if he actually said those words bishloima i amar, but. Um, Yes, Ben. From the, from the line, Zehu Shomrim Alav Ki Adam Gadol means he's not talking to him directly. He's talking it, to, it, it sounds to that himself way. or to somebody else. Okay. Uh, and and uh, the continuation also sounds that way. So it's definitely possible that he did not insult him. Um, I, I, I also think that it's possible that he did tell this to the other rabbis. Although it's not necessarily so, it might mean that he 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 said this to himself. It was his own, you know, uh, understanding. But if he did tell it to the other rabbis, I don't see that being gossip at all. He's got to clarify with them that we're not taking this young man on our bezdin. He's not going to be the one we're going to send people to with with questions. When someone comes up with questions, uh, you know, he's not going to be uh, he's not there yet. You know, so we have to know if we should endorse him or not. And he went back to them and say, I don't know if you should be endorsing him uh, and sending uh, your that's the whole questions. point. That's the whole you know, point that's of Talmud. Awesome. That's the whole point. You know, you got to go it, it takes more time to learn. Doesn't mean he'll never get there. It means he's not there yet. Yes, uh, Ruven. Okay. I'm a little confused uh, on the timeline here. Uh, I'm assuming that when. Uh, uh, the, the son of uh, Reb Zevid said, Maitzi, the halacha lamaisa had not yet been solidified because otherwise right. uh, he was going against the, 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 uh, the, the, the halacha. halacha. And right. I, I know there are stories of Rabbanim in the times of the Gomorrah putting uh, someone who insisted on, on following the minority opinion in Chera. Uh, right or or Zakin Mamre, <laughs> yeah. right. So I mean, are are we at a point? Are we at a timeline where it was still permissible to say Maitzi as opposed to Hamaitzi, or we're, I mean, people are still arguing about it. Uh, we haven't decided for sure what the halachal Maitzi is. Well, uh, it, it 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 seems that two things. Number one is possibly they didn't have clarity, full clarity on it. Number two, that even the rabbis allow you to do the other option. So it's only a question of what's better. Can I, can I read from what it says here, if I may? Sure. Okay. So it says here on this, uh, in the um, Schottenstein. Okay. All, oh, Schottenstein. all agree that Motsi is a valid formula. And thus he's taught us nothing new. Surely the son of Reb Zebed did not mean to rule, did not mean to make a ruling in accordance with the minority view. Reb Zera holds his holds that a person should formulate his blessings in a way that maximizes what can be learned. So both Motsi and Hamotsi are acceptable according to the rabbis. But this, again, the, the, the son of Reb Zevich should have opted for Hamosi, which would have taught us um, blah, 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 some more stuff. Anyway, so both of those formulations were accepted by the rabbis. Right, that's what we just said. He didn't, he didn't want to involve himself in this dispute between right. we said the, that the rabbis, and he gave preference to Hamosi, which is universally acceptable. So he was taking that. the, the uh, diplomatic way out. Yeah, yeah. No, we said that. 
but that doesn't mean um, that what he did was the better option. He he chose one way to do things, and Rabzera felt you know this is this th th there would have been a better option there. You know what he did was not wrong, you know, but but um, now it, what they what, whatever they're they're quoting there is not you know there there is another. You, uh, it, I mean, you yeah. wanted to say originally that maybe he was paskining like Reb Nechemia. They say it can't be because that would be the minority view. Now, um, there is room to say that that he could have he could have done that. I'm not, in other words, um, because in this situation, the the rabbis agree that that's okay. So maybe he felt that since everyone agrees with that way, maybe that is the 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 way people should should be the final uh, the better the better way. You could possibly say such a thing. It's not the fine. It, it, it's not the correct thing, but it, it could have been a it could have been a thought there. So I'm not I mean, sure what their source is. Yeah. translates it. To, I don't know. If they don't have a source, but right. they definitely cover it. Uh, <clears throat> Wait, I had it a second ago. Sorry, I had it a second ago and I lost it. Um, ben, yeah, Ben. I wanted to say, I think all it is that Reb, uh, the son of Rabbi Zera is disappointed in what he did. He expected something more you know, innovative from a right. man that's considered such a big man. Right. That's Instead of taking idea. the middle road, right. expected from him something more important. Right. So what you're saying is, um, you're touching upon another commentary here. Why mm -hmm. is it better? Why would Hamaisi, what is the final conclusion? Why is mm -hmm. Hamaisi better than... The, than, 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 than just doing Maitzi, which everyone seems to agree is okay. Why is Hamaitzi better? So we mentioned yesterday at Taisvis that Taisvis on the top of the page says that Hamaitzi, it allows you not to slur the two mems, the two words. That's what we mentioned. So that would be a reason why Hamaitzi would be better. But there is another source, and this might be what Isaac is, is thinking. Is thinking no. about no. Um, no, no, no. That's where the two Melech, Melech, no Melech Ha'olam Maitzi Ha'olam. Ah, that's why you put the Ha in. So separate. therefore, it's better to do Ha Maitzi. But there is another interpretation, and that is based on a on a rush. There's a the commentary on Sachim, and Taz brings it in the Shulchan Aruch, and that is that the that when it comes to brachas, it, there is a um, a certain priority that a person should should recite brachas in a way that they look scholarly and doing something innovative. And it, it seems a little surprising, but a person is, is, can, can be seen through the way they recite brachas. You can tell who a person is if they're a scholar or not. And so based on that, there's reason to say something that's more mm -hmm. innovative. And by doing that, it will, um, th that's the appropriate thing to do. And therefore, so... Hamaitzi, which people are unsure if it's good enough or not, uh, when you say that that's good, if you recite that bracha, that would be like an innovative way. If it, of course, it is acceptable, and you know that it's acceptable, but even though there's an argument about it and the people question it, uh, when you say it, you're actually showing that you are a scholar and you're uh, taking on the responsibility that Hamaitzi works. And by doing that, that would be the appropriate uh, way to to act in the scenario. And if you if you don't do that, if you didn't do that, what you you, you know you might have uh, tried to follow all views, but you didn't really uh, you didn't do the right. Thing. We um, do it now. We do the we do same thing. Right. When it comes to benching, whoever is the person leading the benching, you listen. Yeah, okay. 
Does he say Bishus Harav? Does he say Bishus Balabayas? Does he go through the list in descending order? Find a lot of people who don't. They just quickly go, you know, Nevarach Okenu, finished and done. And then you have somebody who takes the time to parse it through. Uh huh. Uh huh. So is that broad as that's that that a person can be seen if they're a Talmud Chacham, if they go through that your that list? Is that brought down in Shulchan Aruch? some level we can see it even today at benching. Yeah, that's what, some people just do the nusach. They're not adding anything from the nusach. You know what I mean? If they're doing the nusach, I don't know if you can, unless you say in Shulchan Aruch, it says something like that. No, uh, you uh-huh. don't have anything in there where you put Bashus Rav. You don't see in any bencher Rav. Right. Uh, uh, Elvis, many people just. Hakayin, you go in order, whatever it is. Yeah, you know? I don't know. Uh-huh. I don't know if you can blame people. I mean, people want to just, you know, say what's right, and we're not uh, mixing yeah, in our own words. I'm not blaming. I'm saying you can see and who see how scholarly I do it and took the care uh-huh. to go through it rather than somebody who just plows through it. That's all. Right, right, right. right. Maybe, okay. I don't know. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't judge people from that, but that's okay. I'm not judging I'm, anybody. <laughs> I mean, I say uh, when I bench, I said Bishus Ishti, and that right. gets a laugh around the table. But that's fine. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. Okay, Simone. Yes, Simone. Just to follow up on your point of the idea of uh, saying something in a way that's, let's say, uh, innovative. innovative. You know, another. I think an example. Not, not say it in that way, but an example is if you go go to a let's call it a. A local rabbi with a shayla, he gives right. you sort of like, okay, this is this is the general accepted opinion of how you do something. But if mm-hmm. you go to if you go up the chain, you find people who un, who are able to experts. see the, experts. Yeah, experts. They're able to see the other way to do it, and that actually there is this this way to see it, that way to see it, the other way to see it. So so in a sense, it's that same idea. Can you give us something more than just the kind of a generic opinion? Right. So for right, a good, that's a good example. Very nice, uh, Susan. Also, maybe it's making showing a shem that we have attention to detail and we we are taking the time to to say it exactly the way it would please him. Uh, the rabbis felt. Right, we want to follow the rabbis to the right to the letter and to the right to every detail. Very nice. Okay, that's a good, good point. Rabbi, okay, very good. Yes, Rabbi, uh, Moshe. Yeah. Well, you know, when you say the bracha for Hamotzi, Baruch Atah Hashem Al Kim Al Olam Hamotzi Lecha Min Haras. In other words, you're supposed to stress it. It's not you. You go through it real quick without <clears throat> stressing it. Oh uh, yeah. To, okay. You know, and I've heard a number of Rebbeim say this. It's got to be uh-huh. slow. It should be slow. and shouldn't be done real quick. You know, the word like, hamotzi or the whole bracha? What are you talking about? The, <clears> just the word hamotzi? No, hamotzi. You should stress hamotzi. Let them in haaretz. So which word should it be slow? All of them? Um, well, it should be slow, but it should be stressed on hamotzi. Hamotzi, uh-huh. let them in haaretz. Okay. All right. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. Very good. Uh, so let's continue. So uh, the next Gemara is Ba'al Hayyiraka Yisayim Erechum. So the Gemara says on the vegetables, the bracha, the, this is uh, bringing from the, the Mishnah, the first, the first Mishnah in the chapter. We're just now going to explain these words. These words of the Mishnah. The Mishnah said, that val hayirakais who aimer bar pri adama on the uh, vegetables a person recites a bracha bar pri adama and the um Rabbi, i have a question on on that yeah in the steinsalts they start here from aleph again you know every time they start from aleph is that changing the subject or what yeah um, I'm not really sure what you mean in the Steinzalt stuff. Oh, Aleph is it, maybe, yeah, maybe uh, the way the way they. Yeah, they the last one was the last one was Gimel, and now right. It's maybe Aleph. because it, yeah, it's 
because it's 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 now a discussion on a new part of the mission right yeah so it's like starting a new mission on the same mission it, it, no it's on the same mission but it's a new okay. section of that mission that we're going to be discussing All right. okay so um Thank you. so it says katani yeraka is dumya de pass so the the gemara says that when the the mishnah tells us that yeraka is you recite a um, Bairi Adama. So the Gemara is going to be dealing with what is the bracha on raw vegetables and on cooked vegetables. And the Gemara says that when we say Yeraka is Bairi Adama, uh, similar to what the Mishnah talked about bread. And when the Mishnah talked about bread, the Mishnah said that. Um, um, Peiris Haaretz, you say Bari Adama, except Pass, that said Yeraka is Bari Adama. So it sounds like we're comparing apples to apples. And so if one of the cases in the Mishnah was bread and the other case is vegetables, we're comparing cooked vegetables to baked bread. So katani yuraka is dumya de pas. We learned in the Mishnah that yuraka is his burpi adama, similar to bread that um, the Mishnah spoke about. So just like ma pas shenistana yudeho, or just like bread was changed through fire. Nevertheless, even though it was, um, it was changed through fire, um, nevertheless. It is. Um, um, it stays. It says its bracha. It has its bracha of pas. Af yeraka is nami. So also vegetables shenestanu wa yidei ha'or that change through fire. Nevertheless, the bracha would stay the same. They're still called whatever they were called before they were cooked. So the mission is trying to deal with the fact that there are changes in things and. Um, the changes possibly could change this food item to be considered something else in a different category. And the, uh, uh, and the Mishnah says that uh, cooking does not change it and does not ruin the bracha, make it ch change into a different, uh, a different item. It's, it's still the same thing. That's the initial statement of the Gemara. Amar Rav Ravnai Mishmeda Abaye. So Ravnai says in the name of Abaye Zoysoy Meres, this teaches us that shlakois, vegetables that are cooked, Mevarchan Alem, Baripi Adama, you would recite on them the Bracha, Baripi Adama. So we see that from the Mishnah that cooked is the same as uncooked, and that would be the, uh, the proper bracha. <clears throat> now, the Gemara continues and says, Darash, Rav Chizda, Rav Chizda Darshan, Mishum Rabbeinu, in the name of our master. And who is that? Umanu. And who is that? Rav. So Rav Chizda Darshan, in the name of his Rebbe Rav, that Shlokos Mevarchen Alehem Bari Priyodam, that uh, cooked uh, vegetables, the bracha would be Bari Priyodam. Rabbi Seino Hayarden. May Eretz Yisrael, the rabbis who came from Eretz Yisrael, they came down to Babylon. Our rabbis who did that, who was that? Omanu, who was that? Ula. Mishmed Rabbi Yechanan Amar. Ula, who said it in the name of Rabbi Yechanan. <clears throat> Um, 
there were, I should mention, there were a number of rabbis that used to travel from Eretz Yisrael to, to Babylon, and they would share in Babylon all the innovative rulings that came out of Eretz Yisrael. So, um, so they went down. So this, the, the, in this situation, it's referring to Ula who came in the name of Rabbi Yechanan. He said, "Shlakeis mavarchan aleihem shahakol nihia bidvaroi," that that uh, uh, cooked vegetables, the bracha on them would be um, shahakol. And the reason the under, the understanding at this point is that because they've changed through fire, uh, through being cooked, so the bracha changes. So, according to this, there's an argument of Rav and Rabbi Yechanan regarding the brachas on cooked vegetables. And what it seems like, the, the, the meaning behind it, this point, the way the Gemara is understanding it, it changed. So, the, the food item is not the, this is not really the food of the, of the ground anymore because it has changed. Now, Vani Oimer, now, Rav Chizda says that I would like to, Rav Chizda, who uh, was darshaning in the name of uh, Rav, and uh, then he said that the rabbis from Eretz Yisrael said, uh, the name of Rav, he said, Barpi Adama. Name of the rabbi from the, that Ula, who came down from Eretz Yisrael, said the name of Rav Yechanan, um, that it's Shahakal. And Rav Chizda says, and I say that it's not really an argument. Why? Because they're talking about different types of vegetables. Some vegetables, the bracha that are cooked, the bracha would be bari pri adama. And other vegetables, oh, it's in the car. The other vegetables that, um, it's in a bag. Uh, other vegetables would be shahakol niyabitvar. So what does it depend on? So he says, kol shatchilasai bari pri adama, anything that the way to eat it starts off with bari pri adama. I mean, the normal way to eat it is bari pri adama. Raw, you eat it raw. So shlaka, if you cook it, so what you're doing is changing it from the normal way that people eat it. So the bracha would be shakol niyabedvaroi. Bechol, shatchilasai shakol niyabedvaroi, anything that starts off Shahakol, meaning it's not the normal way to eat it, the way it is, and the reason why it's not, not the normal way, people don't normally eat it this way, so you would say shahakol on it. So then, shlokoi, when you cook it, and you brought it to the normal way that it's eaten, boire pri hoadama, now you would recite a boire pri hoadama. Now, what would be in a case where something is good both ways? So the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the law would be that you're eating it the normal way, either you're raw or cooked. So if that's the normal way, you could recite both of them. That would be the uh, understanding. Now, um, there is one way, there, I'm, uh, there is an opinion that, 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 that argues with this logic and says no. Because you've changed it through cooking, it, since it could be eaten raw, that's the, that is a normal way to, to eat it. So by cooking it and changing it from the norm, from the original form that it was in, so therefore the bracha, you, you lose the bracha. Again, this is an individual view, uh, but it, it, the, the, the simple understanding would be that it doesn't matter cooked or not cooked, if both ways are normal, that the bracha would stay burpi adama, but there is that one individual view that says cooking it actually would ruin it from its, um, from the, um, from the bracha of burpi adama because you've changed it. Okay. Now, uh, the Gemara says here, bishleima kol shatchilasai shahakol niyabitvaroi it's good what Rav Chizda says that anything that when it's raw, it's shahako, shlakai bari pri adama. If you cook it, you recite a bari pri adama, meaning that it wasn't really edible. It's not the normal way of eating it when it's raw. So you cook it 
it's very priyadama, mishkachas, an example of that would be becharba, uh, vesilka, vekara. Karba is um, uh, cabbage, uh, silka is uh, beets, and kara is uh, like pumpkin or gourd or like squash. Um, so these three things, um, the way to eat them is cooked. I don't know, cabbage, a lot of people eat. Uh, uh, in, in today's day and age, we eat raw cabbage. But uh, I guess uh, the, uh, the old custom of having stuffed cabbage, um, I guess that was very popular then. Um, so those are foods that are eaten cooked. Cabbage, well, I don't know what else they would, um, what else they would make from it. But, um, but these are thing, foods, and the truth is beets also seem, at least in today's day, a lot of times they put raw, raw beets in cabbage, in, in, in salads, raw beets in salads, yeah. But um, I, guess that, I guess it's more normal to cook them. So uh, is beets and cabbage. What borscht is that? Is, borscht is beets and cabbage cooked. Oh, okay, okay. So that's it. This is the source. This is the <laughs> uh, source of borscht. Um. So the uh, th so this is an example. Ella calls shat chilas bar piyadama slaka shahakol mechem shkachas. The Gemara says, but uh, what would be what would be a case? Will be an example of something that starts off as hardama. And uh, and after you cook it, it's shahakal. What would be an example? Where would you have uh, something that's uh, that's uh, starts off to be to, to, to as barbi a good vegetable that that's eaten raw? What would be an example that if you cooked it, it would be shahakal? So the Gemara answers on Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchok. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchok says meshkachas la betumi bekarti. This would apply to uh, garlic and uh, leeks that. Um, that uh, I guess they used to eat them raw, and um, and if you cook it, it would be uh, shahakal. I don't know. To to me, it seems the opposite. Yeah, These yeah. are two foods that, at least in today's day and age, I think you only cook, and if you want to eat them, it's at least in uh, on their own. But um, I guess in the olden days, uh, they had different uh, taste buds, and they liked raw garlic and uh, raw raw leeks. I don't know. I've never tried leeks raw. I don't think. Green onions. Uh huh. No, but at least not, don't taste like onions. Potatoes, you would have to do hardamad, wouldn't you? Not cooked. Cooked, cooked. C cooked would yeah for sure. They're cooked, cooked, cooked would for sure be hardamad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would they would fit into the first category. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the Gemara says Darish Rav Nachman Mishum Rabbeinu. So Rav Nachman darshaned in the name of our master, and who was that? Umanu, and who was that? Shmuel. Shlokois mavarchan aleim bar priyal dama. Cooked vegetables, you would recite the bracha, bar priyal dama. V'chavei reino hayor de Meretz Yisrael. And our friends who came down from Meretz Yisrael, Umanu, and who was that? Ula, mishmed Rabbi Yechonon, Amar. Ula, in the name of Rabbi Yechonon. Said Shlaka is Marakan Alayam Shakol Nia Bitbaroi, you recite Shahakol and Vani Aimer the Machlaikis Shinuya, and I, Rab Nachman, I say this is a Machlaikis. And it's an argument among the rabbis. Um, if food is ruined, if the, the, the item, the food item is considered changed by the um, uh, by the cooking. And uh, Rav Nachman wants to say it's based on an argument. Shmuel and Rabbi Yechonon are Amay Roim, but they're, they're basing their opinion on <coughs> earlier views of Tanoim. 